My name is Eric, and uh, just let me welcome you one more time. Um, I'd love to meet you and your family. I'll be right up here after the front, so if you're new to Journey, come on up and say hello. I've been spending a lot of time preparing and planning for a message for next weekend, um, our Vision 2015, so I really want to encourage you to be present next week, bring people with you, because we're going to celebrate the great year that we had in 2014. It was a record year in every respect. Give yourselves a round of applause. God. God is good. And then we're going to cast a vision. You know, in 2014, our, um, our life verse for the year was Acts 1.8, and we're going to stick with that as an underlying verse as we continue on through this series in the book of Acts. But I want to introduce a new statement to you this year that's our vision statement for 2015 that we're going to expand upon and elaborate on for next week. So that is really that our hope is to see the city of Jacksonville transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And what that means is that we time bind that, that we've got some work to do to live on mission. So some of you saw my Facebook post in Spanish this week, were wondering what that meant. So that is what that statement actually is. We're going to expand upon that a great deal next week. But today I'd like to invite one of our elders up to teach. Uh, would you welcome for me Brandon Woods? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this hour. I thank you for this time. God, I believe that your word is true. I believe that we can do what your word tells us we can do. I believe we are who your word tells us we are. Lord, I pray today that someone be changed by your word. I pray that someone be saved by your word. I pray that hearts and minds be renewed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Happy New Year journey. Happy New Year. I said happy New Year journey. Happy New Year. After all we've been through in the year of 2014, God has saw fit for us to be here today despite of whatever we've been through. Despite whatever you've been through in 2014, you're here today in 2015. And that should be confirmation to you that God has called you for a purpose. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. After all you've been through, you're here today. Despite what was thrown your way, you're here today. And that's the confirmation that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. And that plan and that purpose is not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future so that you will seek God's face. We're at a unique and particular time of the year where many will set out with a New Year's resolution or a goal to be better than what they were the previous year. It's become such a big deal that we have this thing called a New Year's resolution. Many will resolve to put off bad habits. Many will set to do something better and maybe you even today have a New Year's resolution. I would say it's because there is something about the newness of a thing. More so than any part of the year, you will find it that many at the beginning of a year are setting visions. They're setting goals. Some that I've even heard over the years is this year, I want to lose weight. No more fried chicken, no more eating out. I, I want to lose weight. I want to do better for my body. Another that I've heard is that this year, you know, I'm going to stop drinking alcohol. I'm going to stop getting drunk. Another that I've heard is I'm going to put away the cigarettes. 
You know, this year and this new year, I'm, I'm not going to smoke anymore. Another that I've heard is, I'm going to stop cursing. And this one is, is more real to me because I had a colleague come to me that said, Brandon, you know what, in, in 2015, I'm going to stop cursing. And it was still 2014. I think it was December 29th or December 30th. And as he's telling me this, he's cursing. <laughs> and I say, yeah, in 2015, you'll stop cursing. It's because there is something about the newness of a thing. Ladies, you even can relate to me with when you go get that new hairdo. It's something about a new hairdo. It, it makes you feel more confident. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel joyous. It makes me, it makes you feel good. I know because I have a wife. <laughs> Ladies, you can relate to the feeling of new when you get that new purse or when you get those new shoes. Ladies, do you hear me? <laughs> and brothers, I haven't forgotten about you because you can understand the feeling of a new thing when, when you get that new collector's item. Or how about that new, that new house? Or how about that, that new car? You can relate to the newness of a thing and the feeling of it when you get that new car. And that's my favorite one, brothers and sisters, because if you've never seen a man with a new car, he'll wash it Monday, he'll wash it Tuesday, he'll wash it Wednesday, he'll wash it Thursday, he'll wash it Friday. And if it rains on Saturday, he'll wake up Sunday morning and he'll wash the car because there is something about the newness of a thing. I'm trying to figure out if, if my son, Brandon, if he, if he got it from me or his mom, because anybody that's hung around me and my family for any particular time knows that my son is crazy about toy cars. <laughs> He's wild about toy cars. So much that I feel that he has about a thousand plus cars and we'll go to the store and he'll say, Daddy, I, I want that new car. And I'm thinking in my head, son, you have a thousand cars at the house that are still packaged up that you don't play with. But it's something about that, that new car that he can have. The newness of a thing. You know, I often wonder if the curiosity of having something new was what caused Adam and Eve to fall into sin at the beginning of time. They were able to choose, they were able to eat from any tree in the garden, but they were not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Any other trees in the garden they can have, but, but not this one tree. And I often think, I don't know about you, but I often think, was it? the curiosity of something new. The newness of a thing. I'll share with you that I had an instance in my life where I was the one who wanted that new car. I had an old car and it was doing just fine, maybe a hundred thousand plus miles on it, but it was good, it was a Nissan. So it was good. Nissan Altima, 3.5 3. SC. It was special. <laughs> but I wanted a new car. So what I did, and I don't think it was quite wise to be vulnerable, I sold my old car that I almost had paid off for a new car, and it just wasn't a new car. This car had rear camera, this car has the navigation system. This car has the sunroof, heated seats, leather, decked out. And I was happy because it was new. But you know, when I got that new bill, <laughs> I almost cried. And I say that to say that everything that's new 
is not beneficial just like everything that's permissible is not beneficial. We've oftentimes, and maybe you can attest to it, found ourselves in difficult situations, in tough, sticky situations because we desired something new. Maybe taking that first drink was new. Maybe taking that first puff was new. Maybe sleeping with that, for that person for the first time was new when so many of us have found ourselves in a world of hurt because we went after what was new. We had a desire in our hearts to get something new. And I don't think that biblically that desiring something new is a bad thing. It's the thing that we are desiring that's new. Is this new thing going to drive me closer to God? Is this new thing going to drive me closer to Christ? Is this new thing for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God? Because we will see the magnitude and the weight of the newness of a thing in Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 and 23 that says every day his mercies are made anew because of his faithfulness. So it shows us that God understands and he knows about the feeling or the cause or the need of a new thing because he's given us new mercies every day. Every day. He's given us new mercies. So on the subject matter of the newness of a thing today, I want to share with you a story in 2 Kings chapter 5 that talks about a man named Naaman who, like you and I, desired something new. 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll be talking about a man named Naaman. So the purpose of this message is to reveal to us and to remind us of the newness that we have in God in Christ as we enter into this new, new year. And I would like to tell you that everything that happened in 2014 is now in the past and you're here in 2015 again because God has a purpose and a plan for your life. So as I go to 2 Kings chapter 5, I'll start at verse 1 just reading to you about Naaman and and as we discover and as we go into the text, there's really three main characters that I want you to know about today. The first being Naaman and who I'll talk about. The second being a young girl who I'll talk about. And the third person who will be a man by the name of Elisha. So the Bible starts off in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1, telling us, Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Haram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Just to put a little context around this place, Aram is in the place of Syria, close to what we've heard about uh, a lot in the church, Damascus. So Aram is in total opposition with Israel. It would be more like a Jew and a Gentile. So God gave Aram victory through this man named Naaman. And the Bible says he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. I'll get to the leprosy in a second, but have you ever felt like in, in life that you were good, you, you, you were strong, you were courageous, but I'm a good father, but I'm a good mother, but I'm a good husband, I'm a good wife, but I'm a good sibling, but I'm a good leader, but. This but is, is something that is, is like a thorn in our flesh that 
even when we want to do right, somehow we don't do right. And, 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 and when we don't want to do wrong, we end up doing wrong. But this but thing, uh, this leprosy thing is, is, is something that is a, a weakness, something that, that makes you feel uncomfortable, something that makes you feel down and, and maybe discouraged. But you're valiant. You're courageous, but it's always something like a thorn in the flesh that seems to remind you of your frailties, your failures, and your imperfections. To put ourselves in Naaman's, in Naaman's shoes, that's what he's dealing with at the time. So about this thing, leprosy, leprosy, I, I will tell you, it's a tale that it will cause, as, as most think of, it will cause your limbs to fall off. But the disease would be so bad that it would look so bad you probably would want this body part or a particular area of your body to fall off. Leprosy will cause the skin to, to look discolored, to look disfigured with skin sores and, and nerve damage to the arms and the legs. Leprosy was, was probably something that, that affected Naaman's performance. It probably affected his, his confidence and shook his ego. I will say to you, and, and I know that there has been a time where that thing in 2014 messed with your confidence. It tested your faith and it made you feel down that that you just wanted a new. Maybe you just wanted a new marriage or or wanted a new child or wanted a new friend or or wanted a new life. But that thing made you feel like, Lord, I want a new. The Bible reminds us in Isaiah. Chapter 43, verses 19. Behold. Behold. God will do a new thing. He will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So what that is saying, what God is saying to us here is that I'll make a way out of no way. When the money doesn't add up, I'll make a way out of no way. Where it looks like you don't know what to do with your kids, I'll make a way out of no way. When you think your marriage has gone helter skelter, I will make a way out of no way. I'll do a new thing. And I want to speak and prophesy to you for this 2015 year that God is going to do a new thing. He's going to do in you what eyes have not seen and what ears have not heard. And it hasn't even entered into the minds of man and even into your mind what God is going to do through you this year. Amen. Amen. If you believe it, that's a amen. So Naaman, in in no uncertain terms, he, ladies and gentlemen, wanted something new. He wanted to get rid of this this leprosy. He wanted to to get rid of this disease. And and how do I know that? I know because once we go through the story by deductive reasoning, Naaman seeks out a healing. If he wanted to stay sick, if he wanted to die, he wouldn't have sought out a healing. We have to understand with the old, we can't. We can't pour old wine skin into to new, new wine skin. It'll mess it up. So in this new year, we can't take what happened that was old and that was a thorn in our flesh into 2014. We have to get rid of it. Name it one of the healing. So it's interesting how, how the story plays out. It's interesting to see how the story plays out as we go through the text. It says that in verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 5, now bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, 
if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So what's interesting to me and, and what stood out in this story to me is that Naaman is noticed by a young girl from Israel. And as I told you a couple minutes ago, Israel and Aram are at odds. They are at opposition. It's more like Jew and Gentile. But she says to Naaman's wife, only if her master, being Naaman, will see the prophet who's in Samaria, he will cure him of his leprosy. I want to tell you on the outset that the young girl's response is a reflection of Christ. And as we go through, we'll see quite clearly that this young girl's reflection is a reflection of Christ. Because that though she is captured, though she is taken captive by an opposing force, she's still serving, the Bible says. She's still serving. She's still looking out for the best interest of Naaman. She's looking to help Naaman. She's looking that this will be a benefit for Naaman. It is not even necessarily going to affect her situation, but she's looking out for the best interest of Naaman. This shows us, ladies and gentlemen, love and concern for her enemy, which outweighs any bitterness and hatred. I mean, put yourself in the situation if you were this young girl and someone had taken you captive and you were to serve someone else, how happy would you be? The Bible says that, that she served and, and that done something for a benefit of another, we would probably be upset somewhere sitting in a corner saying, I ain't doing that. Because you know why? Because I don't like you anyway. I don't suppose to be here. You've taken me from my land and you've brought me to a land where I shouldn't even be. But she shows love and concern and she's still serving Naaman's wife. I want to tell you, whoever wants to be great among us must serve. Whoever wants to be great among us must serve. Maybe we need to serve more in our homes. Maybe we need to serve more in the church or maybe we need to serve more in the community. But I'm going to tell you that service looks a lot like Christ because Mark 10, 45 says that even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. And in his serving, this serving is a reflection of his love because John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So he's serving one because of love and then when he gets here, he's serving and not looking to be served. So I say all of that to say, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen don't let this world lie to us and, and, and make you think that it's a black versus white thing. It's not a black versus white thing. It's a sin thing. And if we take on the mind of Christ and if we look like Christ, we'll get Christ-like results. Amen. I believe that. Because this love that, that, that Jesus talks about, this love is patient, this love is kind, this love holds no records of wrong. This love is not interested in doing evil, but, but doing good. This, this love is not easily angered, but compassionate. And the Bible says that this love never fails. So ladies and gentlemen, we need to know that this battle isn't between flesh and blood. But it's between rulers, authorities, and, and powers of this dark world and, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So, so don't talk to me about going to do a march if we don't want to put Christ back in the schools. Don't talk to me about going to stand on a Highway 95 if we don't want to gather and pray together. Don't talk to me about doing all these other radical things if, if we don't want to put Christ at the forefront of our world today.
Because I know that the weapons that, that the Lord has given us and that the weapons that I fight with are not carnal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Prayer is a weapon. Faith is a weapon. The Bible is a weapon. These are the weapons that we need to use to fight a spiritual battle that we see today and stop allowing the enemy to lie to us and say it's because the color of a skin or it's because of an age or a number. It's because of sin. So we need to use our, our spiritual weapons. She could be angry with Naaman because of her circumstance and, and not give word of, of where she knows of a prophet, of, of where he can be healed. She can, she can withhold that from him, but she does not show an eye for eye and, and tooth for tooth, which most of us know that, that sacred scripture where Christ came saying, do not do, not do an eye for eye and do not do a tooth for a tooth, but to love your enemies and, and do good to those who hate you. We can't overcome evil with evil, but we most, must overcome evil with good. And, and though it may seem like a, a victory that, that may be lost, I tell you to look to Christ and look to the cross and see the victory that he's gained from serve and loving. So I believe, ladies and gentlemen, if we acted on this principle in the Bible itself, America would be a different place. The life of, of, of this young girl shows us how our lives impact those around us. And if we have that mind of Christ who, who did not come to be served, but, but, but to serve the world, it would be a better place. You know, I, I think about this whole service thing, just to go off for a second with me and my wife, because I know in marriage, oftentimes it can be, you do this, or you do that, and you do A, B, and C. But I found that it's a, it's a different flow of things when, when we both have that heart to, baby, I got it. Or you know what, I'll do it. Because we both have a heart to serve one another. And in that serving, there's something, there's a feeling that's beyond what words can explain. So moving along in the story, we know that the young girl is a reflection of Christ and she, she's serving. So as a result, 2 Kings chapter 5 says, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. That's pretty much, Naaman takes a lot of money. Verse 6, the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. I want you to see something that stood out to me that I believe is a revelation to us for this new year. The young girl tells Naaman about a prophet in Samaria. The young girl tells the mistress that Naaman needs to go to the prophet of Israel. But here in the text in verses four through six, Naaman's master who would be the king of Aram is sending a letter to the king of Israel. You don't see it. I say that to, to say, I, I don't know if the king of Aram, Aram is, is spitefully doing this because deep down he's at odds with Israel. I don't know if he's doing this in a taunting or, or mocking way but from this, I would tell you, you have to be careful in this new year, in this new season of where people are trying to direct you. 
Everybody is not sending you places for your best interest. Everybody does not know where you need to go for healing. Because the Bible says that when this letter was sent and and when the king of Israel received this, as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, the Bible says he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and and bring back to life? Why does this this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? You have to be careful of where people are trying to send you and, and you have to know where you should go for yourself so that you know that you're being led by the right person and that you are going to the right place. So, he sent there, and the, the king of Israel is, is distressed. Why is this fellow sending someone to, to pick a quarrel with me? So, the king is distressed because he's been asked to do something that he cannot do. And if, if you've ever been there, when, when you're asked to do something you cannot do, it's, it's a difficult place. But from the cry of the king, the prophet Elijah hears of the issue. And he says, have the man be sent to me. So just a little bit of backdrop on Elijah. Elijah is known as a prophet in the world that that came after the prophet Elijah. In short, in, in, in simplicity, he's a man of God. He's a spokesman of God. So Naaman is now uh, about to to get his healing to catch you up to the story because now he's at the place where he was told to go of the prophet in Samaria. So Elijah gives Naaman some some instructions to to go get his healing. He says, he says in verses 9 and 10, I'll read. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. So he gets the instruction and Naaman Naaman gets angry because he has to go to the Jordan and wash himself. He thinks that because he's from an area in Syria and Damascus that the rivers there are better. And why not if you're going to just tell me to go to a river, why not I just stay in my own place and wash in the river? You're telling me to go to the Jordan. So that's a lot like when God does something in our lives that is in opposition to how we thought it was going to go, we get upset. That's what this circumstance is a lot like. But I will serve you notice that in Proverbs 14 and 12 that there is a way that seems right to man but only leads to death. And there's a way that is right to God that leads to life. So when Naaman comes to his senses from his friends around him, he gets the healing. Because Naaman was angry and, and, and didn't want to go to the rivers. But he was convinced by some people around him that he should go. And that again shows us how our lives and those around us impact the lives of others. So Naaman comes to his senses and he he goes down to the Jordan and dips seven times and the man of God, like the man of God had told him and his flesh is restored and he became clean like that of a young boy. So I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if God said something, he means it and it's going to happen. He's not like man that can lie. So if he said that you're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus, you're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. If he said no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and he did, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. If he said you can do all things through Christ Jesus whom gives you strength, you can do all things through Christ Jesus that gives you strength. So I don't want you to miss the significance here in the story as uh, uh, due to the brevity of time, but I want to tell you that this leprosy thing that he deal, dealt with, uh, and, and oftentimes in the Old Testament, leprosy was known uh, to come from a result of sin. And in the Bible, we can see where the sin comes in, the fruition of the sin, because Naaman, though he's in a culture in the Aram army and in Damascus in Syria, they are known for serving false gods. 
So this God is called a, a God of Rimmum, and this God would be known as like a weather God. So he says in, in verses 17, when he tries to give Elijah's gifts, and Elijah turns the gifts down, this is, this is what Naaman says. If you, if you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my masters in, enter the temple of Remen to bow down, and he's leaning on my arm, and I bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Remen, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. So we see Naaman doing something that is often hard to find in our culture is repenting of our sins and repenting of the wrongs that we have done. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all have sinned. But the significance of this story and the moral of the story is that Naaman was washed clean. The story ends like this, that a, a man named Gehazi, he wants to be paid for this great miracle that just happened in Naaman's, Naaman's life. This, this, uh, pr this uh, servant of God, Gehazi, was the man of God's Elijah, more like right-hand man. So he wants to go, go, go back to Naaman and say, pretty much pay up for what you got. He wasn't supposed to do that. And the story says that, that the leprosy that, that Naaman had, and this is evidence, this is a result of sin, the leprosy that Naaman had clung to Gaizi. And that's how the story ends. And perhaps, perhaps this story ends in such a way like this to let us know, uh, because it says that it went to only Gaizi and his descendants. So perhaps this story ends this way because we are humans and we have fallen short and sinned just like Naaman and Gehazi. So this is something that's in the bloodline that even comes from Adam and Eve. But the significance of the story is Elijah is actually a foreshadow of Christ. And I can, if I had time, I can just really dig into it. But he's a foreshadow of Christ. If you remember being baptized, he's, the, Elijah is telling them to be baptized in the Jordan River. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. That's the significance. He's being washed in water. Oftentimes in the Bible, when we talk about water, it means purification. It means cleansing. If you remember when Christ was crucified on Calvary, a centurion, a Roman centurion, poked him in his side, pierced him in his side, and with came blood and water. Blood is the, the agent that will cleanse us of sin. Water is the significance of showing us this is purification. So as we're in modern times today, we know that Christ has died on the cross. We know that he's risen from the dead. So we have that cleansing, that purification in Christ. We have it through the blood. And I say that to someone today that may still be living in the sins from 2014 and may still have some old habits. I want to tell you that you can't do it alone and that you need Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you not just because I know the word, but I'm telling you because I lived through it in life experiences. I used to be a man a lot like Naaman and a lot like Gehazi. I may look good up here today and I may seem to be able to quote scripture, but I was a sinner just like the two of them. I was the one who chased after sexual immorality. I was the one who wanted to get high. I was the one who wanted to drink alcohol. I was the one who sought after fame and fortune. I was that one. But as the moral of the story is, he got his healing. He got his cleansing. And that's what I want to tell you in 2014, that, that Jesus Christ, he cleans us, he forgives us, and he washes us clean. May you stand, please? God, I thank you for the time that I was able to share here. God, I believe that there's one in here that, that doesn't want to start this new year as they've started so many times before. God, I know that it's, it seems popular to have a, a New Year's resolution, and the challenge I have with it at times is that 
that people try to break bad habits by themselves. But as you show us in the story in, in 2 Kings chapter 5, you have people around us that can help impact our lives where we, we don't have to do it by ourselves. God, you even show us in Elijah, the man of God who, who sent a word who was a, a lot like our Savior, that if we listen to him, we'll receive a healing. Maybe it's you today that has not accepted this Christ and this Savior in your life. I believe you're here today for a reason, and that is because Christ wants to make you anew. And if that's you, maybe you have some questions, but maybe you'll take it and trust it from the story that I share it with you that you can receive a cleansing from, from all that you've done wrong. You can receive a new mind and you can be changed. If, if that's you, every head bowed and, and every eye closed, will you, will you slip up your hand so, so that we can pray for you? You can put your hands down. I would say for the person that slipped his hand up that knows he, he needs a, a savior, he knows that he needs to be cleansed. We don't want to do anything at Journey here to embarrass you, but we want to stand beside you and show you that, that your life, your life means something and that your life will impact others. Will you just, just come forward so that we can pray, pray for you? And I, and I also, I want to say that should be celebrated, ladies and gentlemen. Clap your hands that, that there's, there's at least one and the angels in heaven, and the angels in heaven are rejoicing for one coming to Christ. I know this gentleman here is not the only one, but I know that there is many here that, that wants to enter this new year with a better marriage, a, a better work-life balance, or a new job, or a, a better lifestyle for their parenting, or just a new direction with their children. I know you're in here today, and I just want to end this service by praying for you as well. God, we thank you for this moment. We, we thank you for the souls that will come to you. We thank you for the people here. I ask, Lord God, in this new year that you change the, the people's heart who want that new direction, who want that newness in their marriage and a newness all around, God. Give them that new thing and may it be beyond what they can ask and what they can think and, and what they can imagine. All these things I pray and ask and believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You. Uh, good to see you, brother. That didn't work. We'll try it again. Go in peace. Live on mission. Have a great day, everybody. God bless you.